leave. This is private property. A man searching for vengeance. No, my you do it. A cold-blooded murder in broad daylight. Triggered by an event that took place at 36,000 feet. When the trip of a lifetime turns into the worst civilian plane crash in German history. Investigators must find out how two highly advanced aircraft could be in exactly the same spot at exactly the same time. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. Russia. Moscow. Domodedevo International Airport. July 1st, 2002, 8.10 p.m. 45 Russian schoolchildren wait to board a flight to Barcelona. It's their reward for doing well at school. Among them is 11-year-old Arto Hamatov. At the start of the school year, we agreed that if he finished with top grades, then he could go with the group. When I came back from work one evening, he came up to me and showed me his school report card and said, Dad, look, I kept my word. And he looked at me with a question in his eyes, and I said, good, I promise you can go. The children are from Ufa in central Russia. They've been delayed in Moscow because they missed their original flight. A replacement has been chartered to take them to Spain. Flight PTC-2937 is now ready for boarding. Also on the flight are Svetlana Kaloyeva and her children, Konstantin and Diana. They're visiting their father, who's been working in Spain for a year and a half. I spoke to them on the phone every day, which made my stay easier. But it was hard not to see my children for such a long time. Svetlana is lucky to get seats on this Bashkirian charter. Delays in getting visas meant other flights were sold out. We were finally going to see each other and we were going to have fun together. The crew complete final preparations. Eight forty-eight p.m. The Bashkirian Charter Airlines flight BTC two nine three seven takes off from Moscow's Domodedovo Airport. Distance to Barcelona, three thousand kilometers. Estimated flight time: four hours twenty minutes. Switzerland, Zurich Area Control Center. 11 p.m. 35-year-old Danish-born air traffic controller Peter Nielsen is working the night shift. He and one other controller are managing a sector of airspace above eastern Switzerland and part of southwestern Germany. By day, this is one of the busiest crossroads in Europe. But at night, traffic slows down to a trickle with only a few planes at any given time. Peter Nielsen's colleague goes on a break. Nielsen is solely responsible for all Zurich area airspace. He sets one radar for traffic passing through his sector. And the other for planes coming into land at nearby Friedrichshafen airport. But after 11 p.m., there are no scheduled landings. 
Nielsen can concentrate exclusively on passing traffic. Eleven oh six. Svetlana Kaloyeva and her children, along with the other passengers on the Bashkirian charter, cruise thirty six thousand feet above Austria. They're scheduled to arrive in Barcelona in just over two hours. Six hundred kilometers away. A DHL Boeing 757 takes off from Bergamo in Italy. Destination Brussels. The captain and the co-pilot are the only people on board. Maintenance engineers arrive in Nielsen's control room. So you will be working from the backup, okay? They've come to service the main radar. Eleven twenty-one. The DHL cargo plane, flight DHX six one one, enters Nielsen's airspace. The captain requests permission to climb to thirty-six thousand feet. Swiss radar. Good evening, DHX six one one. DHX 611 identified. Expect a further climb in four to five minutes. Before allowing them to climb, Nielsen has to regulate traffic. Descent flight limit 320. The maintenance engineers now need to work on the telephone system. You can work fast, please. 1125 p.m. An unexpected plane is approaching Friedrichshafen. Nielsen has to switch radar stations. A delayed Airbus, flight AEF 1135, is coming in to land. He calls the airport's control tower to let them know. can't get through. But he still has 10 minutes before the Airbus will land. So he moves back to the passing traffic radar. DHX 611. And gives the DHL cargo plane the go-ahead to climb to 36,000 feet. Climb flight level 360. Nielsen then returns to the Airbus and calls Friedrichshafen Airport again. DTC 2937. The Bashkirian charter calls in as it approaches his sector. Station calling, say again. BTC 2937, level 360, level... But just as Nielsen acknowledges them, the Airbus contacts him. AEF-1135 is inbound. The final approach fix for ILS runway 24. I expect so. I'll call you back shortly. Nielsen calls Friedrichshafen a third time. AF1135. He radios the Airbus and tells them to contact the airport directly. I lost my phone connection to Friedrichshafen. Uh, could you please call them on your second set? Affirm. The DHL plane is now flying over Switzerland at 36,000 feet. Suddenly, its onboard traffic collision avoidance system, TCAS, sounds an alert. Traffic. 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 At exactly the same time, the Bashkirian plane's TCAS system also squawks. Traffic. Traffic. The 
two planes are now 25 kilometers apart. They're flying at exactly the same altitude to exactly the same spot. Peter Nielsen suddenly realizes he has an urgent problem. BTC 2937. He immediately tells the Russian pilots to descend. Set flight level 350. Expedite, I have crossing traffic. Seconds later, their TCAS system says the exact opposite. Climb, 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 climb. This is climb. Climb, climb, climb. climb. At the same time, the DHL's TCAS tells it to descend. Descend. The Bashkirian crew don't know which command to follow. Nielsen repeats his instruction. Expedite, descent level 350, BTC 2937. When he sees that they followed his orders, Nielsen tells them that the DHL plane is approaching from their right-hand side. We have traffic at your two o'clock position, now at 3.60. He switches back to the Airbus. In the Bashkirian charter, the crew are looking for the DHL plane. The two aircraft are now just over five kilometers apart. They are both in descent, closing at a rate of 1,300 kilometers per hour, faster than the speed of sound. It's here, descent. Descent, descent. Here, left. descent hard, descent. Eleven thirty-five p.m. AEF one one three five. The Airbus crew have finally made contact with Friedrichshafen Airport. Can we go, Friedrichshafen? Nielsen can now hand over the plane. Affirm. Bye bye. BTC two nine three seven. BTC 2937. BTC 2937. Within days, the victims' families arrive at the scene. Among them is Zulfat Hamatov, father of 11-year-old Artur. It was a shock. Many parents were fainting when we saw the broken plane wings, the broken tail. 
We still hoped that these children would run in, appear from somewhere, and probably every parent believed in some miracle. Vitaly Kaloyev flies in from Barcelona, holding out for news that his wife and children were not on the flight. One has to be certain. Maybe it was not my aircraft that crashed. Maybe something else had happened. Who can know without proof? Investigators confirm his worst fears. 71 people on board the two planes are now confirmed dead. It is the worst civilian aircraft accident that Germany has ever seen. In an industry protected by multiple and highly advanced safety systems, how could this happen? Now, by rewinding the events of that day, and by going deep into the investigation, traffic, traffic. We can reveal the calamitous chain of events that brought two planes to exactly the same spot at exactly the same time. Investigators from the BFU, Germany's Federal Bureau of Aircraft Accident Investigation, are called to the scene. Jens Friedemann is put in charge of the crash site. The investigation of a flight accident the investigation of an air accident is like a forensic investigation, a crime scene. One wants to establish the facts. At the accident site, we start in total chaos. There's wreckage lying around everywhere. Friedemann can take nothing for granted. Not even that the two planes collided. Two aircraft were in the air. Whether they had collided or just flown past each other too close and lost control, or something like that, we just didn't know. Without the black boxes, Friedemann must try to work out what happened by examining the shattered fragments of wreckage. Key pieces are brought to a specialized storage facility in northern Germany. To Friedemann's eye, the mangled metal soon tells a clear story. The Boeing made contact with the Tupolev in one spot. The vertical tail section was broken off. The Tupolev was damaged around the left wing and on the left-hand side of the fuselage. There was also evidence of a collision on the underside of the right wing. The wreckage reveals that the DHL cargo plane and the Bashkirian charter did collide mid-air. We now know what happened. The question is, why did it happen? How could it happen that they got so close? At the crash site, amidst the fragmented pieces of the two planes, investigators have finally found what they've been looking for. The black boxes from both planes. This was very important for us as accident investigators. The BFU's Johann Royce joins the investigation. It is his job to analyze the contents of the recorders. The cockpit was recorder. The cockpit voice recorders help us understand what happened in the cockpit, how the pilots reach their decisions. Royce begins by examining the pilot's traffic collision avoidance system, TCAS. Our first question was to establish whether TCAS had worked the way it was intended to, the way it was designed. TCAS 
builds a three-dimensional map around an aircraft using its altitude, speed, and heading. All planes fitted with TCAS constantly transmit this information to each other. If planes get too close to one another, TCAS warns the pilots. Traffic. Traffic. And if necessary, gives them what is called a resolution advisory. Descend. Descend. Examining the black box, Royce quickly establishes that the system had worked the way it was supposed to. Traffic. Traffic. Before the collision, both TCAS systems generated and displayed a resolution advisory. The Russian Tupolev was instructed to climb and the DHL Boeing to descend. If the aircraft had followed these instructions, there would have been no collision. But while the pilots of the DHL plane obeyed TCAS, Descend! Descend! The Russian crew did not. Climb! Climb! Experts from the United States are headed to the scene of the deadly mid-air collision of two aircraft in southern Germany. The Überling and mid-air collision is now world news. The media are speculating freely and looking for someone to blame. The pilot of the Russian plane is said to have ignored repeated instructions from air traffic controllers. Why did the TCAS device meant to avoid collisions, in this case, maybe help cause one? And why didn't the Russian plane descend when first ordered? A language problem? Controller commands are always in English. Black box recordings quickly eliminate one theory. Zurich, good evening. BTC 2937, level 360. Wir haben mit diesem Cockpit Voice Recorder with the cockpit voice recorder, we were able to establish that language was not the problem. The Russian crew understood English perfectly well. But the recorders reveal a surprising fact. Climb, climb. This is climb. He's getting us down. We noticed that there was an instruction from the air traffic controller. BTC 2937, descent flight level 350. And we found that at the same time, or immediately afterwards, there was also a TCAS advisory. Climb, climb. At almost exactly the same time, the Russian pilots were instructed to do two completely different things. Descent flight level 350, expedite. Now the crew needs to make a very, very fast decision. What do they do next? And we discovered that the crew had extreme difficulty making this decision. But it should have been straightforward. The two planes were flying over Germany, and European regulations clearly state that TCAS has priority over air traffic controllers. For me, there was absolutely no explanation why something like this would happen. Climb, climb. Why didn't the crew use TCAS the way it could and should be used? By April 2001, TCAS was mandatory in most of the world. But investigators discover one notable exception, Russia. Could it be that the Russian crew did not know how to use TCAS? Rustam Mustafin is a former Bashkirian pilot. He confirms that even though not standard for domestic flights, planes flying overseas were specially fitted with TCAS. As soon as the TCAS requirement was introduced, the training school of Bashkirian Airlines ensured that our pilots were trained to use the system. Mustafin regularly flew with the pilots of flight BTC 2937. By the time of the disaster, we had acquired extensive experience using it. 
the crew knew how TCAS worked, but ignored its instructions. The Tupolev's flight manual, the pilot's operational bible, reveals why. We have from these handbooks learned. We learn from these manuals that the orders from air traffic control always have a higher priority. The operations manual at the time stated that the air traffic control command was to be given precedence over TCAS in the event of the system issuing an alert. It said that the air traffic control had the final authority. Contrary to European regulations, the Russian crew were trained to use TCAS only as an advisory system and could choose to follow the controller's instructions if they wanted. They were following TCAS regulations, but Russian style. I would have done exactly what these guys did. I would have carried out the air traffic control command. Suddenly, we were able to understand why the crew acted the way they did. Investigators have discovered why both planes were in descent. While the DHL crew had followed TCAS, the Russian pilots obeyed air traffic control. But this doesn't answer a more basic question. TCAS is meant as a system of last resort. The planes shouldn't be close enough even to trigger it in the first place. Investigators have turned their attention to the air traffic control room. A controller must advise pilots to change altitude at least two minutes before a potential conflict. But Peter Nielsen didn't tell the Russian crew to descend until just 43 seconds before collision. BTC 2937 descent. Why, uh, Why did the air traffic controller issue the separation uh, order so late? So late that the danger of an accident actually existed. Through shift logs and interviews, investigators learned that Nielsen was the only air traffic controller on duty on the night of July the 1st. Official Skyguide policy is to have a minimum of two air traffic controllers on duty at any given time. Investigators learned that it had become standard procedure at Skyguide for one controller to go on an extended break during the night shift. Tom Larson was a close friend of Nielsen's working alongside him for many years. The way that Peter was doing night shift, we did that all the time. There would only be one controller because there was uh, very little traffic. Between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., there are no scheduled landings at any of the airports in the area. But then, at about 11.25 on July the 1st, 2002, Nielsen is presented with an unexpected landing. There was an approach into Friedrichshafen Airport, which he had to coordinate. It's very unusual that, that one aircraft comes at that time for, for Friedrichshafen. I guess that the controller was, was a little surprised about that. Regulations state that Nielsen must contact the airport control tower before bringing the delayed plane in for landing. This should be routine. One push of a button and the phone connects directly to the Friedrichshafen tower. But records show that Nielsen can't get through. Investigators learned that because of maintenance work, Nielsen's phone system was in backup mode. Even then, the controller should be able to make a call at the push of a button. But a technical examination of the phones reveals a terrible problem. The backup, which should have been there as an additional link, was not working that evening. Phone communication was not possible due to a technical problem. 
Nielsen tries repeatedly to call Friedrichshafen. A routine task is suddenly taking up most of his time. Die gewünschte Verbindung ist nicht möglich. He was busier than would normally have been the case because he had no way of making phone calls. He had to look for alternate solutions. He had to look for other ways to communicate. I lost my phone connection to Friedrichshafen. Uh, could you please call them on your second set? Preoccupied with handing over the delayed airbus, Nielsen ignores the passing traffic. It was like five minutes that he was focused on, on, on that problem. So that took his, his vigilance away from from what was going on, on on the screen, on the radar screen. But his radar has an emergency function that should alert him of the impending danger. Short-term conflict alert, or STCA. Short-term conflict alert is, is, is another system like, it's, it's similar to TCAS, just a ground-based system that helps us on the radar if we miss a conflict. If we don't see it in time, it will give us an alarm. Two minutes prior to a potential collision, an STCA alert should flash on both of Peter Nielsen's radar screens, along with an audio warning. This is exactly what happens 180 kilometers away in Karlsruhe, Germany. Air traffic control in Karlsruhe had detected on their radar screen that two aircraft were getting closer than they should have been. Records reveal that the controller in Karlsruhe tries to call Nielsen to warn him. But Zurich's faulty backup phone system means he can't get through. Aviation rules say he isn't allowed to contact planes not in his sector unless the controller in charge has lost consciousness or has left his post. The Karlsruhe ATC decides to stick to protocol and tries calling Nielsen 11 times in total, but he never gets through. BTC 2937. Records show that Nielsen's visual STCA did not go off. Royce learns that Zurich's radar was also under maintenance, meaning it too was in backup mode. The planned maintenance work on the radar system meant that not all the functions present during normal operations were actually available. In backup mode, there is one particular emergency feature which Nielsen does not have the visual STCA alarm. It's the final piece of the puzzle to explain why Nielsen didn't order the Russian plane to descend until a mere 43 seconds before collision. The investigation showed us that a series of unlucky events all came together for air traffic control. Had Nielsen heard the STCA alarm before the plane's onboard TCAS systems kicked into action, there would have been no conflict and the accident would have been avoided. Then, one final twist. 19 seconds before collision, Peter Nielsen tells the Russian pilots that the DHL plane is approaching from their right-hand side. We have traffic at your two o'clock position, now at 360. Where is it? It is actually approaching from the left, the 10 o'clock position. The only explanation investigators can find for this mistake is stress. It's uncertain if the Russian pilots would have had time to pull up and avoid collision, even if they had spotted the DHL plane earlier. 
but the records show that in the final seconds, they tried. impact, the Bashkirian charter breaks into four pieces. Without its tail fin, the DHL cargo plane spins uncontrollably to the ground. February 21st, 2004. As investigators write up their final report, Vitaly Kaloyev flies to Zurich. He's become obsessed with finding somebody to blame for the death of his wife and children. I wanted to hear them say, we are responsible, but forgive us if possible. They killed so many children and nothing had happened. No apologies, no expressions of sorrow, nothing. Nielsen still worked at Skyguide, but was moving into areas of safety analysis. Kaloyev found where he lived. I went to see the controller. I knew he had been on duty that night. All this had to be brought to an end. Everything had to be closed. I didn't want to wait any longer and decided to finish this myself. Nielsen came out. He was taller than me. I showed him the photos of my children lying in their coffins. He pushed my hand away. Then he got what he deserved. You know, some say it was revenge, but revenge is something insignificant. One is avenging when one has been deeply insulted, but this was not revenge. This was punishment. In Switzerland, a man has been arrested in connection with the killing of an air traffic controller who had been on duty when two planes collided two years ago. Hunted down and stabbed to death in front of his family. Murdered for a fatal mistake. Peter Nielsen was 36 years old. He and his wife had three children. After his arrest, Vitaly Kaloyev is held in a psychiatric institution while the court decides whether he's mentally fit to stand trial. Kaloyev is convicted of premeditated killing and sentenced to eight years in a Swiss prison. In November 2007, he's released after an appeal determines that he had acted with diminished responsibility because of the deaths of his wife and two children. Vitaly Kaloyev is unrepentant about his actions. In May 2004, after almost two years of painstaking work, the German investigative team publish their final report. It's now possible to rewind the events of that fatal day, following the evidence uncovered during the investigation. July 1st, 2002. 8.48 p.m. Two hours, 47 minutes from disaster. A Bashkirian Airlines charter takes off from Moscow's Domodedevo airport. 20 minutes from disaster. At the Zurich area control center, two air traffic controllers are on duty. One goes on a break. Peter Nielsen is now working alone. 12 minutes, 33 seconds from disaster. A DHL cargo plane enters Nielsen's airspace and requests permission to climb to 36,000 feet. Nine minutes, 49 seconds from disaster. A delayed Airbus is coming in to land at Friedrichshafen Airport. Nielsen tries to call the airport to hand over the flight. 
but his phone system is in backup mode due to maintenance, and the backup system has a fault. Five minutes, 21 seconds from disaster. The Bashkirian charter radios Nielsen. It's flying at 36,000 feet and is about to enter his airspace. Good evening, BTC 2937. Two minutes from disaster. The Bashkirian and DHL planes are now at the same altitude, less than 44 kilometers apart, closing in on each other faster than the speed of sound. The short-term conflict alert, or STCA, should now warn Nielsen of the impending collision. But his radar is also in backup mode, so the STCA is not fully functioning. 43 seconds from disaster. Nielsen finally notices that the two planes are on a collision course. He immediately tells the Russian pilots to descend. Descent flight level 350. Seconds later, TCAS goes off in both planes. It tells the DHL pilots to descend. Descend, descend. And the Russian crew to climb. Climb. He's guiding us down. Nielsen is unaware that both planes have been issued advisories. He repeats his instructions to the Russian pilots. Descent flight level three. Russian guidelines allow pilots to make their own decisions in such conflict situations. Here, they follow Nielsen's command. Both planes are now in descent. 19 seconds from disaster. Nielsen believes the conflict is resolved. But before signing off, he tells the Russian crew that the DHL plane is approaching from the right. In fact, it's approaching from the left. Three seconds from disaster. The Russian crew have spotted the DHL plane. They pull up, but it's too late. Descend hard, descend! At 11.35 p.m., the planes collide 35,000 feet above the city of Überlingen, Germany. All 71 people on board the two planes die. The German investigative report concluded that Peter Nielsen and the Russian pilots had made serious mistakes. But the primary cause of the accident was negligence on the part of Skyguide. In May 2004, immediately after the BFU report is published, at a press conference in Zurich, the CEO of Skyguide, Alain Rossier, issues a formal apology. Es sind auch bei uns Fehler gemacht worden, und wir we too have made mistakes, zutiefst. and we most deeply regret this. We take responsibility, as outlined in the German investigation report, and we ask the families of the victims for forgiveness. In September 2007, a Swiss court finds four Skyguide employees guilty of negligent homicide. Three managers who tolerated the single controller policy are given one year suspended jail sentences. The project leader overseeing the maintenance work on the night of the collision is fined 13,500 Swiss francs, roughly $11,000. Following recommendations from the German investigative team, Skyguide implements a variety of procedural changes. They now ensure there are always two controllers on duty, even during the quiet night shift. Nobody will ever find themselves in Peter Nielsen's position again. Investigators also recommend that international and regional TCAS regulations be standardized along with aircraft operations manuals. TCAS must have ultimate priority over air traffic control. One cannot say with 100% certainty that this kind of event will never happen again. But we are very confident that we were able to make a significant contribution to preventing the repetition of an event like this. 
Don't miss Extreme Angling in brand new Wicked Tuna, continuing on Sunday nights at 9, only on National Geographic Channel. Seconds from Disaster is back next.